Welcome to the first edition of Tomlin's Tips, the best bets of the NFL Wild Card Weekend. I'm your host, Michael Tomlin, providing you the information and picks that you should need to have some fun and make some money wagering on football. This podcast is brought to you by FantasySixPack.com, one of the industry leaders in providing quality and accurate fantasy football and other sports wagering content. Speaking of Fantasy Six Pack, the owner and CEO, Joe, Joe Bond, just wrapped up a phenomenal season breaking players for fantasy football. For those of you who don't know, the aggregate website, Fantasy Pros, compiles every fantasy football analyst rankings, well, except for a couple of prominent ones that are scared of how bad they might do, but I won't name names, you can go and look for yourself. The site ranks the rankers, so every week, industry giants like Brad Evans and Jamie Eisenberg, as well as Joe Schmoes like myself, submit our rankings, and they are graded on accuracy. So Joe finished the year fifth overall among all experts. To be able to crack that top five is just remarkable. I thought I had a solid year in the 40s and a couple top 10 finishes ranking defense and quarterbacks, but he really blew it out of the water. This is basically my long-winded pitch to get you to go check out the website as the content is truly top-notch, especially our fantasy football rankings. So on the website, I have a weekly gambling column called Tomlin's Tips. Every week of the season, I give out my five best NFL picks against the spread, similar to the Las Vegas Super Contest, which is basically the biggest NFL gambling contest in the world. I also picked every other NFL game, as well as giving survivor plays and over-under pick each week, and my favorite bet of all, the three-team ten-point teaser. At the end of each column, I gave out my best college football bets against the spread as well. The number of picks varied upon how much I liked the slate that weekend, but they came on strong at the end of the season. There's still some bowl games going on right now as we get this posted, but my best bets for the year for college are sitting at 58, 51, and 1, and as of right now, I'm 24 and 12 in bowl games. My NFL best bets <coughs> took a tip. Dig a dip at the end of the year, but finished a respectable 39, 45, and 1. In all other NFL games, I was 80 and 77. Yes, that is an awkward number because the, it was posted on Friday, so I didn't pick the Thursday night games. My game totals went 8 and 9, and my teasers were a sparkling 12 and 6. All in all, if you placed a $100 bet on every one of my best plays, you were up $510 this season heading into the playoffs. The point I want to make here is that this is about as good as you, I can do, really. I'm not a professional better who lives in Vegas, although I'm currently coming at you live from the 26th floor of the Bellagio on the Vegas Strip. Yeah, but even professionals only aspire to attain 55% uh, mark to make a profit. So anyone that tries to tell you they have all these guaranteed winners or they their, their bets hit at about 90%, they're lying. I would probably just bet against whoever tells you that. So enough background info, let's get to the games. Uh, before the actual games, though, let's talk a little strategy. Betting in the NFL playoffs is almost a completely different handicapping style than the regular season. In the regular season, you're factoring in motivation, bye weeks, travel time, rest, revenge factors, so many other things. In the playoffs, the sole focus is the game. There definitely is not a motivation factor unless a team coached by Jason Garrett sneaks in. The playoffs are also generally going to have teams that are more even than your average NFL game. It seems simple and dumb to say that, but it's definitely a factor in handicapping the game. Most importantly to me, though, there are so few games. The Las Vegas books are better at setting lines than almost anyone else is at doing anything. Seriously, there's a reason these hotels are so high here. They are nearly perfect at getting 50% action on both sides. When you get to the playoffs and there are only four or two games the whole weekend, they're even better. Once again, I might have taken the scenic route, but my point here is that you're not finding a bad line. When I say bad line, I mean that it's not two points too low or high based on the power rankings of the teams. So the real factor in the handicap in the playoffs is the matchup within the game that can tilt one side or the best to the, or the other. For example, my most important two statistics for close matchups between good teams are third down conversion percentage, both offense and defense, as well as red zone touchdown percentages. How often is that team converting on third down, or how often is, are they getting off the field defending the third down? How often is this defense forcing field goals in the red zone, or is it their offense always punching it in for touchdowns? This is especially important with the current state of field goal kickers in the NFL, given that it was the worst year percentage-wise in decades. You will hear me reference these stats quite a bit, but there are others I will get to as well. It's all about trying to find that one match within the game that you think it's going to score. So, all right, let's get to the 2019 wild card, NFL wild card best bets. First game of the weekend, we have the number five seed, the 10-6 and six Buffalo Bills, at the number four seed, the 10-6 and six Houston Texans, who won the AFC South. Games uh, Saturday afternoon, 3.35 Central, 1.35 Vegas time. Current line is Houston by three with a total of 43.5. 
Buffalo lost three or four, both straight up and against the spread coming into this game, but that's a little bit deceiving. They didn't really try in week 17 because they were already locked into their spot. Their other two losses were coin flip losses to Baltimore and New England, so very respectable at that point. However, they were 1-4 and four against other playoff teams. Houston was a terrible favorite this year. They were 1-6 and six against the spread as a favorite and have not covered in that role since week 5. They're 2-5 and five in their last 7 against the spread and 3-7 and seven in their last 10. However, they were a solid 3-3 three and three against playoff teams, and one of those losses they didn't try against Houston. Buffalo was one of the best under teams in the league, going under the total 12 out of their 16 games. These two teams are no strangers to close games, as only Detroit played more coin flip games than them. When I say coin flip game, I mean it's a game that comes down to the last second, who has the ball last, which way does that ball bounce, almost a lucky thing, as a coin flip is. These games tend to be about a 50% for each team, except some of the more elite quarterbacks can push that up a little bit. So what you'll see sometimes is regression with it, i.e. the Cowboys were 0-7 this year in these games, so next year you would expect them to be a, a above average in them. Houston went 6-3 and three in them, Buffalo went 4-5, and five, so neither one was that far away from the, the mean. Houston was 7th in the league in converting red zone touchdowns at 64.15%. However, their defense was dead last at defending red zone touchdowns, allowing teams to convert 71.43% of touchdowns. Buffalo was around league average in both, but with that bad of a defense, they should take advantage of it. Houston was decently decent at covering uh, converting third downs, eighth in the league, 43.52%. But once again, their defense let them down, 31st in the league, 48.51%. So what I'm saying is half of the time that Houston faced a third down, they allowed the team to convert it. And almost three-quarters of the time that the opposing team got in the red zone, they converted a touchdown out of it. Houston was also 28th in the league in sack percentage at 5.02. They just could not get to the quarterback much. J.J. Watt is coming back, but I'm curious to see how much he will actually be able to affect the game. Houston was also 27th in the league in allowing sacks at 8.4%, while Buffalo was 10th at 7.37. They should be able to get to Watson, which usually causes trouble. On the injury front, both Kenny Stills and Wolf are questionable, but look like they're going to play. Laramie, Turmel's, Laramie Tunsil, the Texans tackle, is also questionable. In the end, I think Houston's defensive shortcomings will be the death of their playoff run. Give me the Bills at the plus three points, especially if Will Fuller plays, this becomes a best If Will Fuller does not play, this becomes a best bet. Will, when Will Fuller's on the field, Deshaun Watson averages over one whole yard attempt more for every attempt. So look, keep an eye on that, but as for now, still take the Bills plus three. In the other AFC game, Saturday night, we have the number six seed, nine and seven, Tennessee Titans at the number three seed, the 12 and four, New England Patriots, the champions of the AFC East. This game's at 715 Central, 515 Pacific. Current line is New England by five with a game total of 44.5. New England was one and five against the spread down the stretch, two and six in their last eight, but they were three and three against playoff teams. Tennessee had a, a Massive change when they went to Ryan Tannehill midseason for Marcus Mariota. Since then, they're 6 3 and 1 against the spread, nine times covering the over in those 10 games. However, they were 2 and 3 against playoff teams with two very deceiving finals. One of them was the game against the Texans last week, but the Texans were already locked in and didn't try. The other was the luckiest one of the year against the Chiefs, where the Chiefs had two botched field goals that could have won the game. Shockingly, Tennessee leads New England in both yards and points per play by pretty significant margins. Who would have thought Ryan Tannehill would be out playing Tom Brady, but at this point he has been. However, New England's defense has been stepping up to the plate. They're first in the league in, a, in defending third down and fourth in the league in red zone percentage. Tennessee, however, it led the league in red zone touchdown percentage at 75.56%. I know that Number doesn't mean much to you on the outside. I'll just tell you this, though. The difference between them and second place was more than the difference between second and 13th place. That is an obscenely high number, and I would expect that regression to come back down. Defending the red zone was not their forte, though, as they were 31st in the league, giving up 68.09% of touchdowns. So I think New England will be able to score on them, and then those have to get the stop as as an elite red zone defense against an elite red zone offense. Another key factor that I'm looking at here, though, is sack percentage. New England 
is sixth in the league at sack at sacking the quarterback, getting to him on 8.06 of the dropbacks. Tennessee is last in the league at allowing sacks, giving up the sacks on 11.11% of dropbacks. That means one out of every nine dropbacks, Ryan Tannehill's getting sacked. New England will be able to get to him, so maybe look at that sack prop over. Another another discrepancy, New England's fourth in the league in time of possession, while Tennessee is 28th. So that New England has been able to hold on to the ball, and they could keep Tannehill off the field, too. But one thing that scares me about the Patriots is their ability to stop the run. They've, they've played four top-tier running backs or fantasy RB1s this year. Nick Chubb had 20 carries for 131 yards. Mark Ingram had 15 carries for 115 yards. Zeke had 21 for 86, but that was in the monsoon and, you know, tripping and stuff. Joe Mixon had 25 for 136. So those four backs averaged almost 120 yards a game at almost six yards a carry. Now, Derrick Henry would shine in this situation, you would think, but I feel like he's going to be a bit down after carrying the ball 31 times last week as they try to get in the rushing title. The Patriots should be getting Edelman back this week as well. And I think that combination of having a, Brady having his a security blanket back on the field will keep the Titans, the Titans off the field and neutralize their running game much. What it comes down for me is I don't want to be sitting in the sports book Saturday night regretting that I did not take Tom Brady at home against Ryan Tannehill in a playoff game. Give me the Patriots minus five. So we go to Sunday in the NFC matchups. First game is the number six seeded Minnesota Vikings at 10 and six at the number three seeded 13 and three New Orleans Saints, the champions of the NFC South. This game's at 12.05 Central 10 Pacific. Current line is 7.5, total is 48. Something I want to talk about here for any new bettors. Uh, whenever you see that 7.5 or 3.5 and you want the favorite, always buy the half point. It may cost you some juice. So instead of 110 to win 100, it might be 125 to win 100. But you don't want to you don't want to pass that key number up that you can take a loss on when you can buy the push. New Orleans is on a roll, covering 11 of their last 14 games, six and one straight up in their last seven, with just a coin flip loss to San Francisco when George Kittle went beast mode. They're two and one against other playoff teams. Minnesota's two and three straight up in their last five, and they're one and four against other playoff teams. While both of the teams score similarly, similarly, sorry, in the in the red zone, Minnesota's second in defending the red zone at forty three point seven five percent, while New Orleans is twentieth at fifty nine point five seven. <clears throat> New Orleans was better on defending third downs, though, as they're sixth in the league, and Minnesota was nineteenth. A key factor that I'm seeing here, though, is that New Orleans was starting league allowing sacks at just 4.13%, while Minnesota was 26th at getting to the passer. It's another discrepancy in uh, time of possession as New Orleans was starting the league and Minnesota was 26th. Minnesota, Minnesota should get Dalvin Cook back here, which could help with their time of possession woes. New Orleans can get on the roll, though, as over the past three years, they're 19-9 and nine against the spread after scoring 30-plus points, which they did last week. And they're 21 and 8 against the spread after an after an against the spread win the last three years. And the biggest stat that I saw in all my research this week was New Orleans has New Orleans had just eight turnovers all season, breaking the previous record of 12. That's also with several games started by their backup quarterback, and they're still able to take care of the ball that well. <laughs> One other factor is, is New Orleans getting two Kirk Cousins. There's a misleading stat called pocket time, which takes the time it, from the snap until the quarterback uh, either releases the ball or gets hit. Minnesota leads the lead in that, but it's misleading because they have the fourth fewest QB scrambles. Whenever a quarterback runs, that automatically stops the pocket time, even if it, there was no pressure. And also, no one can really blitz it at the the Vikings because they're scared to single covered have single coverage on Stephon Diggs or Adam Thielen. However, the Saints do have solid corners that should be able to take on that task and then get after the quarterback. I just think that Drew Brees and Michael Thomas will sustain long drives and they'll force Kirk Cousins into mistakes. Give me the Saints minus seven by the half point. Last game of the weekend, we have the number five seeded Seattle Seahawks at 11 and five, traveling to the number four seeded nine and seven Philadelphia Eagles, who squeaked out the NFC East title. It's at 340 Central, 140 Pacific. The current line is Seattle. Favored by one in 1.5 points on the road, even though the line opened at Philadelphia, favored up by a point and a half, and the total is 45. Seattle Seattle lost three of the last four, was 0 and 4 against the spread in those four games, failing to cover by 32 points. They were three and three against playoff teams, though, as they usually rise to the occasion. 
Philadelphia, on the other hand, has won four in a row and has basically had a, been in the playoffs for a month since they were five and seven. They're three and one against the spread in the last four, and they're two and three against the playoff team this year. The only rematch of the wild card weekend is Seattle won 19 to seven in Philly a few weeks back. However, that was before the team fully unleashed Miles Sanders, who has turned into quite the running back. Seattle was 26th in red zone defense this year at 61.54%, while Philly was third in red zone touchdown percentage, converting two out of every three times. Philadelphia was fourth in the league in both third down conversions and third down defense, while Seattle was 16th in both categories. Philadelphia was 12th in sack percentage, sacking quarterbacks 7% of the time, while Seattle was 30th at 4.447%. Philadelphia was also ninth in sacks allowed at 569 while Seattle's 28th allowing sacks 8.5% of the time. One of the biggest factors in this game is all of the injuries that have happened to both teams. Seattle lost a linebacker Michael Kendricks last week, who was their fourth leading tackler, third in sacks, and second in tackle for tackles for loss. Bobby Wagner and K.J. Wright are stout defenders, but having Kendricks as that third linebacker was really big for them. On the other, on the other sideline, the, the Eagles have had injury woes all season, and then they lost Pro Bowl guard Brandon Brooks, Last, Brandon Brooks last week for the season. Miles Sanders should be back, although Zach Ertz still is questionable as he has not been cleared for contact. They do get Avante Maddox back in the defensive secondary so that they don't have as many cluster injuries back there. Lane Johnson could also be back, and still Nelson Aguilar and Alshon Jeffrey are questionable. I see two major advantages here for Philly, though. Philly had the seventh most yards before contact on, in rushing this season, and Pro Football Focus had them as the number one run blocking team in the league. Seattle was 29th in tackling, and that was before Michael Kendricks went out. Seattle is also 30th in, in pass blocking per Pro Football Focus, and Philly is sixth in pass rush. I just think the Eagles have these two massive advantages when they run and when they rush Russell Wilson. That sounds like a solid formula for Miles Sanders to have a massive day and the Eagles to cover the 1.5. That's it for my game picks, and I'll quickly go over the other bet types. As I said, a 10-point teaser earlier is one of my favorite bets. You, you tie three teams together that you think will cover, but you get 10 points from the spread, i.e. their seven-point favorite turns into a three-point underdog, but all three have to win. So my two favorite uh, favorites this week would be the Saints taking them to plus three and the Patriots to plus five. I also like the Saints-Vikings over 38. Well, I like the Saints-Vikings over 48 as my game total of the week, and then you can take down 38 for the teaser. I just think that the Saints are going to put up 30 without breaking a sweat right now, and Kirk Cousins is king of the garbage time stats and maybe a backdoor cover attempt. <coughs> That's it for the NFL. There are a few college games left. I will quickly just give you the Ohio Bobcats minus eight versus Nevada Wolfpack, although I think that line is currently driving up as I'm recording this. I'll take the two-lane green wave minus seven versus the Southern Miss Golden Eagles and the raging Cajuns of Louisiana Lafayette minus 14 versus the Miami Red of Ohio Red Hawks. In these uh, group of five game, bowl games like this, I usually like the big favorites to come out early, take a big lead, and run away with it. So that's it for the first edition of Tomlin's Tips for the NFL Wildcard Round of 2019. Be sure to check out the website, follow me on Twitter at Tomlin3, T-O-M-L-I-N-3, and keep up to everything that we provide. See you next time.